Peace, everyone. Welcome to Masters of Ceremony. This is your host, Andrew Ascari Poor, also known as Fifth God. On this week's episode, we have my good brother, the incredibly talented artist, Sam Lindenfeld. Sam is an artist and painter from Washington, D.C., who now resides in Brooklyn, New York. And he's really somebody who continues to consistently blow me away with his artistic creations and expressions. Uh, This is a very visually based podcast for those who are listening to the audio only. We actually showcase some of Sam's art here in the recording space and also on the YouTube version of this podcast. We show some of the digital images of his artwork. So for those who are listening to the audio only, I hope that you can continue to hopefully still receive some insight and enjoyment out of this podcast. But If you really want to check out some of Sam's work, maybe check out the YouTube version or scroll through his Instagram at Sam Lindenfeld. You can check it out in the show notes as well. Um, Sam is someone who I felt like bringing onto this platform because as I state in the podcast, I think it's so important to document certain artists who are early in their career, but who are showing such deep promise into becoming uh, what I would call a a legend in sorts. I think uh, Sam is well on his way of creating a portfolio of work that is going to stand the test of time. I think he is someone who is talented beyond, uh, beyond a state of doubt. I mean, you look at Sam's work and you see that he has something. So... In this episode, it was really an honor to be able to discuss how Sam got into art through actually having a speech impediment or learning issue at a young age and using art as a form of communication. We speak about the culture of DC and how that raised him, how eventually going to school in New York and becoming a New Yorker uh, assisted him in expressing himself Uh, especially through meeting our mutual brother Radamiz, where Sam actually did over 15 pieces of individual artwork for Rad's album, Nothing Changes If Nothing Changes. We speak about Sam's spirituality and how that impacts his artwork. And uh, we go into so many different topics surrounding art, surrounding finding one's own voice and unique style. And it really was just an honor to be able to sit down with an artist with a friend who I think is so incredibly talented and has not even reached his peak yet. So I hope you guys enjoy the episode. Please stay tuned afterwards to learn more about how you can support this show, which I'm sure you already know. But um, we really appreciate all the support, all the attention, all the love, and enjoy the show. Peace. Sam, my brother. How you doing? Welcome to Masters of Ceremony. Thanks for having me. Of course. It's... um, This one's really special for me because I'm trying to really show my listeners and whatever audience that we're building together here that I'm not only interviewing rappers, I'm not only interviewing people who know about plant medicines and other things I'm interested in. I'm trying to learn and educate myself at the same time. So um, for those people who don't know, you're an incredible artist. I think artist would be the most appropriate word. Um, An incredible painter and uh, someone who I think has such an interesting mind that I know no one will ever be able to actually get to know to the fullest fullest extent because your paintings are so <laughs> oh, they're just so deep you know there's there's no amount of answers you can give that would define what everything means in your artwork well, thank you but, man, um, I appreciate it you're someone who whose mind I want to explore further so thank you for coming on man thank you so much for having me this is my first i think we talked we talked about this before but this is my first interview on anything yeah for the most part yeah it's an honor man and um you know also with this podcast um before we even really get started a big influence is to simply document what is going on right now within the circle of people i know right um the current new york scene even though you're from dc Mm -hmm. um that's always been a big motivating factor of mine to simply document document and showcase all the beautiful art that's being created right now. So 
I hope people enjoy this episode now in 2020 and beyond, but I know that a lot of this work is going to be really appreciated in years to come. Thank you, so, man. Thank yeah, you. man. That means the world. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. What have you been working on recently? Have you been painting at all before we even I get took started? A, I took a little break. I took a little break from painting for a little bit. Yeah. For the most part, I've been doing more like commercial work. Mm -hmm. um, just like for like, hire stuff? or For like just like album covers, mm. t-shirt, merch, stuff like that for um, for different people. Um, you know, doing stuff for Radimus, who we both know. Of course. Uh, so I've been, that's mostly what I've been focused on, but my scope of time is really fucked up. Mm. So I'll say that, but that's really what I've been doing. Yeah. I was really painting like a couple weeks ago. Yeah. For the last couple of weeks, I've just been doing that. Okay. So in my mind, I'm like, when I say like, oh man, like I haven't been painting. It's really cause like in my mind, not painting for a couple of weeks is a long time. Yeah, of course. So I'm probably going to do it when I get home. Yeah. yeah no <laughs> now, doubt. That I, now that I said it out loud. Of so, course. Of yeah, course. Yeah. Just to showcase to the people. Yeah. An example for those who are watching, I'll also throw it up digitally, but um, there's just, we have these beautiful examples of, of Sam's work here. And um, I would love, there's so many questions I have for you because a lot of your work is so cryptic and dense and layered. Yeah. Um, but I guess what I want to just know first is for you to bring us into your earliest household memories, yeah. which have maybe helped shift you towards creating some of this really beautiful art. Like mm -hmm. you grew up in DC. Yeah. Um, how was it, man? How was it growing up? It's it's weird because I I mean, it's all I ever knew, really. It's mm -hmm. where I lived there for 18 years. First 18 years of my life. I'm 23 now. Um so I lived there for most of my life. It's a strange city. It's a city that has a lot of uh, really, um, uh, really bold contrasts. Mm. I would say. Yeah. I grew up in different parts of the city. I uh, I was born at Columbia Women's Hospital, but I spent you know the first like kind of years of my life in Capitol Hill. Which now is a beautiful neighborhood. Mm. Well, was, how how was it back then? It was pretty fucked up, to be honest <laughs> with you. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Um, and then I ended up when I was still quite young, I moved across town to Northwest, closer to Tenley Town, which is like a kind of like a neighborhood that has less crime. Okay. Um, but at the time, I mean, Capitol Hill was a completely different place in the late '90s, early 2000s. You know, there was a lot of, at least on my block, there was a lot of prostitutes. There was a lot of, um, you know, just people who were just kind of strung out. Mm, um, wow. And there was a lot of people who were kind of hiring these sex workers to uh, to do their work for them. And the people who would hire them were federal workers, mostly, wow. who were on their way to work at the Capitol building not too wow. far away or whatever, you know, government um, department that they were working for. So that was kind of a kind of facing that and having my parents kind of like explain that to me at a very young age kind of gave me a a, a very like, kind of strange understanding of of um of who who runs what mm. you know what i mean yeah and then my um my dad also worked in politics as well mm. so it was kind of um it was kind of a uh you're kind of seeing a lot of strange contrasts going on of course on. it seems like it yeah i mean when people think of dc you know, I think right away they think of, I mean, let's say the average person, they think of the the government, the government and yeah. politics side of things. Um, people who think about music, of course, know there's such a deep history of. Yeah, of, of go-go music yeah. and punk rock and shit. Yeah, I would say yeah. the word that always comes to mind when I think of DC music is innovation. Yes. You know, they're such innovators. And yeah. um, I kind of see that even coming through your, your paintings in Thank a you, sense. Man. And yeah. Um, Growing up and seeing this deep contrast, as you say, yeah. uh, I feel like I can see that it, of course, impacted your artwork. But yeah. at that young age, did you have a desire to paint or draw ever, yeah. ever since those those times? Or? Yeah. I, to go on to your point earlier as well, mm -hmm. I think the, the, the first thing that I think about DC, I think about you know, the government, of course, but I, I mostly think about like the rich history of of um of the people who are from there it's, mm. you know it's formally known as chocolate city some people still call it that yeah. but it's a city that is you know built on the backs of of once enslaved people you know and that informs i think to this day that informs 
the overall culture of the city. And that's what kind of brought about, um, you know, there not being a, a statehood mm. in the District of Columbia. Yeah. And also it brought about um, a, uh, a rich history of culture, you know, spanning from the food to go-go music to yes. Chuck Brown to, you know, what then became the mayor, you know, Marion Barry. You know, these things, I think these things all are cataclysmic in a way, and they kind of form um, the culture of the city. But it's also like, you know, I'm, and then, so that that kind of informed my understanding of of the world pretty early mm -hmm. on, too. Yeah. Was um, the nuances of, of all of that. Yes. You know, and kind of seeing that firsthand and also kind of seeing it from afar because I, you know, there are certain parts of the city where I couldn't participate in all of it when mm. i moved across the city when i was very young you know i that every neighborhood is kind of its little bubble and of that course. was just a little bubble too of course so yeah but as far as the art goes when i started painting i started painting when i was four when i was four years old wow. or like drawing really but it was because i was uh this is a fucking weird i don't know it's i think <laughs> please share well i was that oh shit you're good <laughs> god um uh, i was uh diagnosed with this uh sensory disorder called auditory processing disorder mm. and that's a um it's a it's a sensory um disorder that affects your hearing it especially it especially affects your uh your speech mm. so it kind of how it works it's kind of like dyslexia but for for speech and sound mm, interesting. Um, I kind of people with auditory processing disorder kind of hear uh noises at the same frequency at the same volume but at this, you know but very close so it's very hard to differentiate sound and speech and understanding anything in a in, especially in a learning environment of course um and at a young age at a super young age and then if you have it like I did you know if you had it at a really high frequency it makes it hard for certain individuals to learn speech so i had to go to a lot of speech therapy as a kid thank god my parents could afford to send me to speech therapy because yeah. i wouldn't be able to you know do any yeah. fucking thing you know i wow. wouldn't be functionable um to even go to school or go to college or anything mm. so i would have never known that about you yeah. because you don't seem like you have any no. speech disabilities today <laughs> no not at all yeah. i mean it's just even to some people, like my speech therapy a therapist as a kid, see, it jumps out a little yeah. bit. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I have a very similar story as well. That's why I'm interested really? in this. But um, yeah, just not, I actually, um, we had speech class yeah. in my different schools growing up and uh, it was optional, mm -hmm. but for whatever reason, I never partook in these speech classes. Yeah. And that led to, I guess, during my development, not being able to uh, pronounce certain syllables yeah, and yeah. words properly. Even till this day, I um, experience some of this difficulty. Yeah. And um, from my own experience, just to divert a little bit, what I want to ask you is this experience of what is the disorder called? Auditory processing disorder. Was this traumatic for you at all as a, at a young age? Or did you not really know like I that you was, had something? In a way, I don't mm. know if it was traumatic, but it was definitely something that I had to overcome at a young age. And, and you were aware of it. I was pretty aware of it. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I was aware that I was going to speech therapy and I couldn't, you know, and I was speaking word. I couldn't speak a language really until wow. I was like five or six. Oh, wow. That's late. Yeah. Pretty late. Yeah. It's pretty late in the game, right? Yeah. 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 So I was pretty aware that I wasn't at the right, um, where I was supposed to be at, at a young age. But I think that I was just really blessed being around people who were, uh, really supportive, like my parents mm. and, you know, some of my family friends who just kind of understood that, you know, I wasn't un, I didn't have a disability. Yeah. You know, mm. I don't think I ever had one. Yes. I think it just kind of took a while to kind of get up to snuff with yes, talking. Of course. So I think it definitely, and to this day, I mean, just the way that I hear is, I guess, kind of different. Mm. Um. So it really, yeah, I think it informed a lot about my attitudes about um, people who have to work a little harder to get what they mm, need to get in yes, life. Yes. I think that was my first lesson at a young age. Mm. And so how that ties into painting was that I would go to speech therapy, but because I couldn't talk, you know, I had to draw out my sentences. Oh, wow. So my speech therapist would be like, how was your day? Like, what were you up to? I had to draw it out because I didn't know how to write either. Yeah. 
So that's kind of how I got into it. And then I, at the same time, I had this crazy obsession with, with like dinosaurs, which is like what you do when you're like, <laughs> I'm laughing because it's so similar to my path. Like really? I, I don't want to just keep on interjecting about myself, but it's hilarious yeah, yeah, because yeah. I had a, um, I think it was in kindergarten. I had a teacher, like, you know, they ask you what you want to be when you grow up. Yeah. And my answer was a dinosaur. You wanted to be a I dinosaur? I wanted to be a dinosaur. And That's at that, fucking and at that crazy. age, I didn't know that it wasn't possible. You know, I mean, maybe it's, maybe it is Dude, possible. Dude, who fucking somewhere. cares? It yeah. probably is so possible. And, and I, I believe the teacher told me like, Andrew, like, that's not a real vocation. You can't become a dinosaur when shit you're out older. Of here. <laughs> and, uh, what the fuck I, is she talking I, about? I remember actually um, telling myself that I, uh, I didn't feel discouraged when she said that. You didn't feel discouraged I didn't. Yeah. It's actually a distinct memory I have that I didn't feel discouraged. I Did think, you feel more encouraged? I just felt like... Um, I didn't see any sense in what she was saying, you know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see any sense in what she's saying. Yeah, you know? so I feel no. you, man, completely. Yeah, I wanted to be a paleontologist. Oh, wow. So not too far off. Yeah. I wanted to be the person who found a dinosaur. Yeah. I think I remember when I was a little kid, I met this dude who who was in, I was like obsessed with these fucking um, like videos from National Geographic on mm-hmm. VHS <laughs> that yeah. where people would fly out these these archaeologists paleontologists fly out to Mongolia mm-hmm. and like find bones and that was like I didn't even care about like Beauty and the Beast and Disney movies I like <laughs> loved that shit yeah. I was obsessed and then I met this dude who was in the video who flew out to Mongolia who was in that VHS really? video you just happened to meet him somehow? yeah I happened to meet him and yeah. I happened to be able to know how to talk by then so oh wow we, so I was like like way later, like years and years later. And I was like, just like, it was like, I was meeting my favorite rapper. Yeah. I was like, wow, <laughs> dude, how'd, the, how'd you fucking do it, man? Yeah. And I could yeah. like, I forget most of the names of everything, but I yeah. was like, I had read his like scientific reports on mm-hmm. how he went about going on this journey to Mongolia to yeah. find, uh, um, this like underwater, um, I think it's like a colacanth or something. Mm. And it was amazing. Wow. And I will never do that work, line of work. Yeah. Like that, so, you know? so, so these were some of your goals early. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And uh, it inspired me a lot. Yeah. Did yeah. you, did you have the desire around the same time of like, was like be, becoming a painter or an artist even a thing? Or was it just uh, a means of communicating because of this speech issue you had? It was a, definitely a means of communicating. But I think that at an early age, I was always, um, I was always like uh, given little like streams of consciousness that led to that mm-hmm. because my my grandmother was an artist as okay. well. She yes. um, and she immigrated here from Germany as a Jewish person during mm-hmm. World War II um, as a refugee, and so did my grandfather. He came from Austria, and then when he was a kid, he moved to Canada because the United States wouldn't let him in at the time. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that sort of sparked the idea of what an artist was, but I didn't really know what, um, that all could be, uh, at, you know, at the age of four or five, I didn't know that being an artist was, um, an option at all. Yeah. Cause I was never, other than my grandmother, I was never really around people who were artists. I was around people who were, you know, working, yes. um, somewhat people who were working in politics, mm-hmm. like my dad and, you know, some of our family friends, but for the most part, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't super aware until much later. And so I, I met more adults that kind of told me like how to go about doing things. And then I kind of came up with the conclusion for myself at mm-hmm. some point, yes. probably in my, like, by the time I was like 10, yeah. I think I really knew. Mm, yeah. Okay. So as as we were saying before we started this show, um, this is such a, a show of discovery for me as well, getting yeah. to know you deeper because you don't have any prior resources to no. um, study or look back on, which, <laughs> which I love. It's, it's an honor to uh, be able to have you on here and get to learn about you as we're recording. But I'm curious about what was the general energy and vibe in your house growing up that maybe impacted you not only as an artist but as just a young man growing up you know your father being in politics your mom doing whatever she was doing I think uh I mean I was an only child but I grew up with a lot of different people in my house um you know my parents were there my I grew up 
and lived with my godfather for over 10 years mm. when I was a kid. And he really, you know, he was kind of a, a kind of like a brother, or older kind of brother figure to me as a kid. And then we had tons of people who moved, who were moving to DC to get work, who were staying at our crib for sometimes years from all over the place, um, from Ireland and Memphis, Tennessee and mm. shit and um, Philadelphia. So I was always around like a really multicultural kind of multifaceted house because these people were from, you know, all walks of life, all races. Yeah. And so I, I think from an intimate level, uh, it was different to to see that um, compared to other kids in my neighborhood. And then um, at the same time, I mean, you know, I definitely had a dysfunctional family situation mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't. I don't know how much legally I can get into it. But, <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, my dad was going off and doing whatever with his uh, with his um, political work that ultimately landed him in some really deep trouble with, um, you know, the feds, mm -hmm. right? That I, that we weren't aware of, mm -hmm. um, having to do with a candidate that he was working with closely. Um, and I can say that because that's. It's on, public. That's public. Yeah. You can do course. research on that. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> that's no something doubt. you can learn. No about. doubt. <laughs> but um and so that was a that was a diet. And that was something I found out when I was much older. I think I was probably like 17, 18 at the time. Mm, wow. Uh yeah, he was looking at some serious time for a second there. Yeah. But um thankfully, you know, that that didn't happen. I'm very happy for him that that got handled. But you know, yes. that was a family dynamic that um really kind of uh changed a lot about how I viewed people that I, um, that I viewed. Oh, that's crazy. Um, the, <laughs> the train right trains, there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, people that, uh, I viewed as, um, what's the word? Uh, kind of responsible, mm, responsible yes. and positions uh, of power. Yeah. It, it made, I already had this prior knowledge positions of power, even when I was a kid, when I was much younger, being in Capitol Hill for a little bit, but I think that as I got older, yeah, that definitely really changed mm. the way that I saw positions of power, and it also changed, inspired me to understand what I really wanted for myself. Mm, of course, you know, do I want to be surrounded by somewhat problematic energies, or do I want to pursue um, this path as an artist, not only to be true to myself, but also so that I can create a foundation for myself that I can be proud of. Yes, of course. You know, and uh, nurture that for somebody else later down the line. Yeah, so. completely. Yeah. I um, I see in so much of your pieces uh, a showcase of just the human struggle. Yeah. That's a theme that I see. And I think, um, I don't know if, that's something many other people see. I'm sure maybe is a it's something a people have brought up theme. a lot with me. Yeah, yeah, I see this um this energy of perseverance and resiliency, and also some of the heavy just feelings people go through in life. Yeah, and um. You answering that question that way gives me a little bit more context of maybe why that comes through some of your work. Yeah. But when, just to circle back, when you really began painting in a, in a sense of wanting to really create rather than just communicate, yeah. um, um, even though you're communicating through your paintings now, um, when you actually kind of started to set out and be a little bit more intentional, mm -hmm. Around what age was this? And uh, were you using it as an outlet of kind of self-healing, self-expression? No, I mean, I, um, I I was really trying to figure out how to be, I think by the time I was like 10 or I think by the time I was like 12, I was really trying to figure out like, how do I be an artist? Mm. Like, how do I be, how, how can I be an artist, not a kid that draws yes. for fun? Like, how do I do that? So I met these, these guys who were like these editors at this fucking magazine or something. And I was talking to them and I showed them my little portfolio and shit, stuff that I was working on. <laughs> you had a portfolio when yeah, you were 12. No yeah, doubt, yeah. No doubt. And, um, and he, and they were kind of, their advice was you need to have a style. You need to have a style and you need to not only have a style, you have to have a voice. And 
that will be the key to your success. Because if you you don't have a voice right now, you're 12, right? Yeah. So you need to understand what goes into that. And it, you may not even understand it until you're like 30. Yeah. And I, and I took that advice pretty, pretty close to heart at that age. And um, I mean, I was, damn, I, I'm starting to realize I was around a lot of really, uh, I grew up around a lot of really, really um, d- dry, humored, uh, mm. and, and, and just straight up blunt. just blunt adults that just yeah. told me like what I needed to do, mm. which I'm very blessed for. And that was, and I kind of took that with stride to be honest. Um, and then we had a, yeah, I had, and, that, and that was kind of, that was kind of a similar way. I met another dude that um, stayed at my house during the inauguration of Barack Obama in 2009. He was inaugurated in 2009, February 2009. He was elected November 2008. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. 2009. Yep. And um, I had this guy, it was a friend of my godfather's. And he stayed on our couch for a bunch, for a little bit. And it was like 10 of his friends and like one of them was sitting on my couch and he was an artist. He's still an artist. His name's mm-hmm. Ibra Ake. He's great. Mm, he, dope. Uh, he's an amazing photographer. An oh, incredible wow. video director. Yeah, he's awesome. He's the best. Mm. He, does, he does things with, with Donald Glover, but he, his, his personal work is, in, is, is so great. Oh, wow. So you had someone like this. Uh, just staying at my house. Easily accessible to you. Wow. Yeah, he just like stayed on my couch. He just happened to be friends with my godfather because they knew each other from New Jersey. Because mm-hmm. my godfather's from New Jersey. My mm-hmm. dad is also from New Jersey. Oh, but, okay. Dope. I didn't um, know that. And he looked at my sketchbook when I was a kid, and he, I think he told my parents that I should go to art school. And he kind of told me about art school as a young child. And that was my first moment where I knew that, where I could, where I was like, oh, you can go to art school. You can yeah. go educate yourself on something you love. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, yeah, there was a lot of great people that, like, I was blessed with a lot of good advice mm. at a young age. Not, I meet people growing up who just didn't even really know that at all yeah so yeah yeah. that's a blessing man um i think it's something that a lot of youth are lacking today something that i've touched on in previous podcasts is just the lack of mentorship and Mm. um, guidance from elders oh yeah um, usually people who find that voice and find that style had someone uh reiterate that same message to them yeah of you need to find your own voice yeah because uh i believe when you don't have that the simplest way of creating something that you think has life is to imitate. That's only, that's only natural. Yeah, it is you in know? a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like many artists go through that process of, of imitation first of just being inspired, of yeah. course. But, um, you know, when I met you through Radom is mm-hmm. the first thing, I think one of the first things I said to Radom is about your work was that I've, I haven't seen anything like it before. Mm in the means of the style the coloring the the line structure yeah um the way you draw eyes of people Mm. all these little small quirky things right it didn't look like you were uh copying others and i know you were inspired by other artists but for, oh, yeah. for me, I, I couldn't even see where the inspiration was coming from. You know, sometimes you see a painting and you say, oh, this person is obviously inspired by so-and-so yeah. or something, you know. Right. And I'm not someone who knows that much about, you know, historical pieces and, and art in general. But that was one of the first things I noticed about your work was that, Thank okay, you, this is completely unique and original. And um, I'm curious. So you went to Pratt? I was Pratt Institute, yeah. Okay, yeah, and school. I'm curious when you started to develop this style and if by going to school it helped you refine this style or if going to school actually even assisted you in, it assisted in your painting? Me. Okay. Yeah, I already had a style before, but I think art school opened up the floodgates of understanding um, just material processes for me to be able to kind of grasp it mm. to its fullest extent. I don't think I was fully grasping it mm. when I first arrived. Got you. Yeah. Mm, and uh how was that experience of moving away from dc coming to new york and uh being immersed i mean i'm sure your father being from jersey you've come up to new york in this area oh yeah a ton times. of times yeah before mm. prior to going to pratt i went to new york a bunch of different times yeah 
you know, I have family from, you know, they live in Westchester now, but they're from the mm -hmm. Bronx, mm -hmm. from Yonkers. So they would take me to the city all the time. Okay. But prior to Pratt, you had never lived in, in New York. No, spent I spent, you know time. what? I spent a summer here. Yeah. Did like a little like summer program thing here. And I mm. lived in, I lived in Brooklyn for a bit for no a summer with my friend, with my, my best friend Indigo, who's from mm. Brooklyn. He's from oh, wow. Park Slope. Dope. Um, but he had moved to DC when he was 13. That's when we met. And he was like. So I would come, even prior to that, I would come with him up to New York, you know, just fuck around and, you know, watch, like, see, like, concerts and, like, yeah. visit his grandma and shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> was so, there a transition, not not to interject, but was yeah. there a transition of, like, New York feeling very different than D.C.? Or cause No. I, I, I see a lot of similarities, I even see, though I haven't I see spent too much time many, there. I see more similarities than I see differences. Mm. Or, I think there's a difference. The difference to me is that DC has, I mean, just geographically and culturally has more of like a Southern kind of mentality to it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of yes, ma'ams, you know, yes, sirs yeah. and thrown around. There's a lot. The the, the way people talk is very different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the attitude is a little slower in DC just because of the proximity to the South, I feel yeah, like. Of course. But as far as the way that people, the way that people interact overall and the way the city's laid out and how to kind of how to kind of move in general is very similar, mm. especially in places like Bed Stuy. Yeah, you know, um, our, I was there, and I mean, I could tell people were looking at me crazy because I'm like just this white kid that <laughs> moved to Bed Stuy, and yeah. you know, like anyone who moves to Bed Stuy, I think if you have a conscious brain, you can tell people are like, oh yeah, you're fucking not from here yeah, at all, of you course, dickhead. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So I could see. I could see that people were looking at me that way because when I was a kid, I would see other people in a not so different light mm. who were moving to DC as a kid. Ah, I see. So you got to see your own gentrification process yeah, growing up in DC. In a way, yeah. yeah. It didn't affect me as much because, you know, well, it does now. I don't know, you know, I don't think anyone in my family can afford to live there mm. completely yeah. or be comfortably living there. But, um, you know, at least we weren't pushed out but i could i could feel the the um attitude of who is this what what are you doing here what do you mm. why why yeah. would you come here you know why would you uh buy frozen yogurt right now? <laughs> this is unreal <laughs> yeah you know yeah um so i think that uh all of growing mm. up in dc and having family friends and family that are from new york kind of prepared me a lot mm. I, I didn't and to this day i feel totally comfortable here you seem like it man yeah, I, I love mean, it here you, i wouldn't be surprised if uh you know new york has some characters yeah, so hell some, yeah sometimes you see people and sometimes people assume that person's not from here but they grew up in bed style their whole life or exactly you know but um new york shines through a lot of your work especially through radamus and stuff of course i appreciate you it, guys were working on it together but um when you come to New York and you're going to school now, yeah. was there an increase in your creation of, of different pieces? Was there more mm. inspiration than when you were in DC? How did your um, style continue to develop? And I would love to speak about how your style has developed as well. Yeah, I think that when I first came to New York, I was uh really wrapped up in um in just trying to mostly um kind of build my own life in a way i was kind of, i wasn't really thinking about the work more so i was you know my you know my dad had just gotten was about to get sentenced and i was like just kind of freaked out and uh i was just trying to like find a at the time i was like 18 19 i was just trying to find um kind of like a just like a, a a middle ground just like this is my outlet mm. situation but as far as the work goes i think that um i think the, i was kind of pulling from um i was pulling from i was always pulling stories from other people and having it inform my work kind of superficially mm. you know i was taking symbolism and um and kind of nuanced material you know visually and oh shit and then you know um kind of incorporating that into the work and kind of making it into a kind of like a soup of 
bullshit. Mm. You know, <laughs> I, I I always think that when you paint, especially when you're trying to communicate with your paintings or any visual media, it's kind of like cooking. You know, you have to have all of the different ingredients balance each other out perfectly. Mm. I wasn't really well versed in balancing my symbolism out. I was mm. taking things from my past, from the history of DC, and um, from my own history, and kind of meshing it together. And I think that by the time I finished art school, I was I could I had a better grasp on how to sophisticate. You know, how to sophisticate that process. Mm, yes. Of um of taking symbolism and making it uh, work for myself. Mm, you knew how to curate your, yeah. your ideas a bit more. And I didn't want to misinform people on who I was, you know? Because mm. at the time I was making a lot of, uh, I was using a lot of like black symbolism to, symbolisms that, w symbolisms. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> um, that would be connotated to black culture. Mm. And I wasn't totally... I mean, I was educated pretty closely on that history, but I don't think I was totally educated on how to use that symbolism mm. correctly. How to use that sim symbolism in a way that would historically, you know, um, yeah. stand the test of time. I had some pieces that definitely did that, but there were other pieces that weren't as successful. So I, I had to, um, as I was at art school, I had to kind of do a lot of searching and understanding what the history of that was as well as kind of placing um, myself in my own history. Mm. I, think, I think more than anything, like going to art school is kind of like, not going to art school, but fuck, I mean, fucking, I don't know, fuck college. I mean, it's <laughs> just like when you're between the ages of 18 and 25, you're really trying to understand who you, what your voice is. I don't even know if I'll ever have a voice until I'm like 30 still. Lord. But I think that at the time I was really trying to figure out what, um, where my voice was going to lie. And I think mm. going to school and learning, you know, kind of upgrade, like jump starting these processes kind of yeah. helped get me there. Quickly. I'm sure being around other artists and teachers who yeah, hell yeah. Um, had examples of crazy work probably hell yeah. influenced you as well. Hell yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm. And it's, uh, and those people really inspired me a lot because they were, I was seeing people that were, who, some of them, you, you were kind of watching people who had different degrees of understanding how to be honest with themselves. Mm. Some of them were incredibly high and yeah. you admire those people. Some of those people you're seeing and you're like, okay, they're still trying to figure it out. Yeah. It's you funny know? you bring that up for me, even up until this point now, um, when I work, when I look at work that really moves me. Yeah it always has a deep sense of authenticity. Even, right. if, even if it's raw, even if they're still discovering themselves, you can see that it was authentic. Right. That's the stuff that moves me very strongly and I'm sure many other artists. Yeah. And um, that's something that I think many young people, many people of all ages mm. are still discovering, especially if they're creative, not only if they're creative, but especially if they're creative, how do I use my voice in an authentic manner mm. that is actually who I am and not just a uh, conglomerate of influences and yeah and symbolism from different places as you've alluded to yeah. um something that I myself am still discovering and I think the biggest thing I received from college and it seems like you've received it as well is having other people around you to help you orient yourself yes. of how do I want to portray my art yes. and, and how do I want to stand out as well. Yeah. And um, yeah, man, your pieces, they stand out, man. It's as simple as that. It's like a piece like this, right? Mm. And you, you let me know this is one of your older pieces. Or it's yeah, not, it's I not made a this in my like, piece. Yeah, I made this like a year, two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I think. Mm. Yeah, I so don't, I don't like, work like this at all anymore. Mm. Yeah, which is so interesting to me because um, I obviously still see your style in it, yeah. but uh, I do see a big difference in some of your more recent work. But when you go to paint something like this, mm. even though this was some time ago. I'm just so curious where the intention is behind some of the aspects. You have this person wearing a New York 
hat. Mm. They're stepping through what looks like an ocean towards or a just flooded street from the fire hydrant. Yeah. Towards a street that has some beer cans, a 40 ounce, some blood spilled. Uh, they're carrying a torch that looks like something similar to what the Statue of Liberty is holding. Uh, there's the the stoop with the blood in the back. There's a the, this is the worst Statue of Liberty ever drawn. In, crazy in, in, it's a, like, in American it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's unique, man. Yeah. <laughs> you got the the mushrooms, the Amanita muscaria mushrooms. Yeah, it's like you got to treat every opportunity to to say fuck America <laughs> with every. You have to do it in every way possible, and sometimes it just takes um just like just really being just like treating some symbols with no respect mm. with zero uh intention of being accurate yeah because people get it of course you know yeah it's a it's a process of uh just being defiant yeah of yeah. course and yeah. sometimes you know being defiant can be just like pointless but of course um but it's like i'm not even specifically asking you what the intention is behind this piece i yeah. want to know what if you can allude to some of the process of when you're going through creating a piece like this, yeah, how are you deciding what symbols and uh, expressions of paint you want to use? Yeah, I mean, it's um, with this piece particularly, I did a it was like an assignment for a class. We were we were making pieces based on this one poem, which was about this um, young woman in New York who ultimately was sexually assaulted in the poem um mm. and uh it was a really r heavy piece and i wanted to kind of for the piece i guess i mean everyone interpreted it in their own way which was awesome and they were all great but i guess we're talking about me now <laughs> <laughs> and uh um i wanted to be able to show her in a defiant kind of um dignified stance mm, and i yes. was already kind of into i've always been into like uh the contraposto like one foot in front of the other mm. you know two arms out pose that's an old kind of european italian pose that they use in a lot of renaissance paintings mm. it's probably why people like it is because i think we've all been inundated with certain symbolism and and uh and and in compositions that we find beautiful yes whether we, whether we know why or whether not. whether we know why or not people look at this painting and they're like this is this is great it's because you know i'm using with some of the composition i'm using some european old motifs motifs mm. which is what a lot of my favorite artists do and you can kind and the best artists use those motifs in my opinion and make them their own or mm. they flip it or they use it to their own advantage no matter mm. if they're from that background or not yeah because at the end of the day it's like you in a real ode to those pieces is being able to kind of make those things malleable because one day they'll make your shit of course able to <laughs> um but as far as far as like the painting processes go i mean um just understanding lighting and understanding um contrast and color and yeah I, I try to at the time i was really like fucking into just like stamping symbols on corners i still do that i did yeah. that with this yeah. but um so I would, just to kind of make space and guide the eye in a certain way but I, i'm trying to understand like how to pictorially like work is this boring i don't know if no not at all shit, man nah, um I mean, I mean, if yeah. it is people could tune out i'm, yeah. I'm, I'm interested man <laughs> um uh, i've been trying to figure out how to like put kind of graphic symbolism into paintings that function for the pictorial aspect of it where you 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 see it and it's part of the scene it's part of the um it's part of what's being communicated it's not mm. just stamped on top mm, understand you know yes because uh I don't know that's a little fucking aggressive right you know mm. to just like put a mushroom on there you like <laughs> the mushrooms which i appreciate <laughs> but i hate that shit i hate that i did that because i i wish that i was a little bit more clever in how i understand what you're saying yeah. I, I feel like uh and i've heard you say this maybe elsewhere that um there was a time where you were still discovering maybe still am yeah. not to be so overt with yeah. certain symbols no. and not just for it to be 
this is what it is. It's right in your face, you know? Yeah. And uh, some of your recent work definitely has stepped away from that, it seems like. It's For a, sure. It's, it's I think a it's more abstract. I think it's just my mindset in life in general has changed mm. in that. I think when I was younger, I was really mad. I was really aggressive and shit. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I was just mad at a lot of stuff. I, I just didn't really like where I was at mentally. I thought that the environment that I was in at art school, even though art school is an incredible privilege, I think going to college in general is an incredible privilege. And I took it on. It was my choice. And I have no regrets of going. But there were times where the people I was surrounded with there, I just didn't feel very, they didn't feel like people I grew up with. I didn't feel like I could connect with a lot of them yeah. sometimes. They're from a different kind of, you know, not so working class background, mm, I guess. I understand. Yeah. Um, Coming from D.C., which was very diverse. Yeah, and I, I had already known what it was like to have everything and lose everything at the same time. So I was angry. So my mindset was very, uh, was very like, this is it. This is what it is, bitch. Mm, Fuck yeah. you. <laughs> Here it is. Here it is. Yeah, yeah. People don't like that shit at all. Yeah. It's insane. You know, mm. I was super, yeah, I was super aggressive. I was going out and just doing some dumb shit in the street sometimes. Yeah. And um, just being ignorant as fuck. And mm. I think that that was my mindset. And I think by the time I made this piece, I was kind of coming out of that mindset of, um, you know, this is what it is. I'm laying, yeah. laying it all on the table. <laughs> yeah. Whereas I think now I'm understanding that, um, you know, I need to grow up, mm. right? I need to understand... Um, I need to understand uh, how to um, be dignified in myself first. Mm. And that's what kind of gives the work its dignity. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So for people who don't know, I the reason why we're sitting here today is yeah. because of our mutual brother, Radham, is yes. who you met maybe around this time yeah you know, not, not too long before this actually yeah you yeah. guys really started working on nothing changes if nothing changes about like two years ago or so yeah yeah so that was my first yeah. exposure to you and although at the time i wasn't familiar with your previous work you know mm -hmm. i scrolled through your stuff back then mm -hmm. i definitely saw that there was an influx of new energy in your work working for Radamiz and with Radamiz. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that, inf that informed me on so much. Yeah. Working with him, yeah. And it seems like, just to circle back to your point about how you were feeling at Pratt, you know, being around people who you maybe couldn't relate to that much, yeah. that uh, meeting with and working with someone like Radamiz gave you a sense of, okay, this is someone who I at least get energetically. And um, Hell yeah. Yeah, your guys' relationship work-wise and as uh, as just a brotherhood it has been so beautiful to witness. You guys Thank crafted you, this beautiful book together, which yeah, I'll yeah. show some shots of yeah, in the for video. Sure. No doubt. And um, you created a piece of artwork for every single one of his tracks yeah. that was on Nothing Changes If Nothing Changes. I did, yeah. 14 tracks plus the cover. That was crazy. Plus <laughs> many other pieces that never you know, even made the cut. I'm sure. No, we went um, through so many revisions and so many different images. Yeah. Interpretations of the of the work he was doing, yeah. really. I mean, his with my work, with him, his work comes first mm. at the end of the day. Yeah. It's his voice, literally. Mm. Yeah, that was a... I love that dude. He's fucking great. <laughs> yeah, I love man. that guy. I don't think I tell him enough mm. sometimes. I'm sure he knows, man. Rad's someone who is very... Uh, if you get close to him, he loves you just as much, man. You know, yeah, he, he he gave me so many opportunities early. I think that I, one of my biggest blessings was when I got out of school. Was he was the really the first dude I was working for and with. Mm. Um, and that was that was awesome. That was the biggest blessing I could have had. Mm. You know, as a from a from as a student because I remain a student. I of think course. we talk about this. We yeah. both are still students of our craft. Definitely. Um, that was the best course I could have taken mm. for sure. Yeah. yeah. How, how was it working? Cause I know growing up you were into hip hop, you know, yeah, you were into yeah. punk, you were into rock, you're into all these different yeah. things. How was it creating art pieces for a hip hop album? I don't, I don't I'm assuming was, that's something you didn't really do before. No, it wasn't really something I did before. I did some things here and there. I did a lot of work. I did a lot of professional like artwork before I went to art school. I did a lot of, uh, 
like portraits for people. That was like my business for a while. I did mm. drew portraits for people. But I always was inspired by hip hop music from my godfather. My godfather introduced like I was always around rap music, mostly like go go music mm -hmm. growing up. That's what I heard a lot. I heard a lot of R and B go go music. Um, and then I would hear like 50 cent on the radio, <laughs> my, you know, my mom, she's like a white woman from Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> she was like, you can't fucking live in this shit. Blah, blah. You know, I was like, what the fuck? What are you talking about? Like yeah. many men is the best track yeah. of all time. Are you crazy? I mean, obviously I didn't say that to her. But yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, I'd be crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I went to my godfather and I was like, Hey, uh, cause he's from, he's originally from Brooklyn mm. and from New Jersey. And um and he made beats too at the time. Oh wow. Yeah. He made wow. beats. He made really good beats. Wow, that's dope. I think he still makes beats, but he showed he I was like, Can you just like give me like some music? This hip hop shit's incredible. And he was like, Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. And he handed me the first two albums I ever received as a, a as a human being was uh Things Fall Apart. Wow. Um I mean obviously, um, you know, uh, I think it was Ready to Die by Biggie. Mm -hmm. And, um, all right, is that the name of the fucking, I haven't listened to that album in so long. Yeah, for Biggie, yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Yep. I got that, and I got AT Aliens okay. by Outkast. Wow, Ready to Die, AT Aliens, and, and, and Things, uh, fall, things apart. fall Apart. Things Fall Apart wow. was the number one in my heart. Yeah. 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 And uh, from a young age, I always knew, like, I think growing up in, hearing more of that i was i think i was like seven mm -hmm. i was pretty young yeah and then um growing up and hearing more like down south kind of music mm -hmm. like master p and yeah fucking you know lil wayne yeah brick squad all that i kind of knew like that people didn't respect these guys at all People didn't respect their voice and they didn't respect what they had to say as a, at face value. Mm. They had to respect the package, the idea that they were threatening. Mm. They weren't. They were talking. They were, it was more, I knew that I, it felt multifaceted to me at the time. So I always knew, I was like, man, I really want to work for and with uh, someone in hip hop and give and, and help make really sophisticated, you know, branding for them because these mm. guys like, you know, because my dad would introduce me to like Grateful Dead and I would see the crazy yeah. T-shirts and posters. And I'm like, why wouldn't, you know, why wouldn't Nas get that? Mm. Yeah, it was very photo centric when it came to hip hop yeah. covers. At yeah, least it was a lot of Jonathan Mannion type yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. At that time. Was or like, especially during the Little Wayne era, there was just like those collages that you could see were done on like yeah. Microsoft Paint. Those were beautiful something. though. Yeah, those were those were those super were innovative. Really beautiful. Those, those were a different style than from the, yeah. the '90s photo po portraits you were seeing. Yeah. You know, um, it's crazy. There's an artist whose name I'm forgetting right now, but he used to do a lot of like. The old company flow covers and like a lot of covers that came out on raucous records that were mm. super intricate drawings like f for pharaoh manch and um i remember there was one far side record cover that i loved yeah yeah i know, you know exactly what i'm talking which, about yeah, yeah. That, one was, that one was amazing yeah so but those are always like for a little bit more of the underground music yeah so i understand what you're saying on a mainstream level there wasn't so much sophisticated art no it just seemed like these creative directors just didn't respect their 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 branding mm. in a huge way and i we're seeing that now i'm really glad that some of these artists are getting the you know the the budgets that they need for that kind of stuff but, yeah so this was know. something you always wanted to do or said to yourself if i work with hip-hop artists i want to create some dope yeah branding. i would love yeah that is something in my mind that really like stuck with me for sure mm. yeah. so getting to work with rad obviously as you said was a big blessing for huge you huge blessing um especially the fact that you didn't just do a cover and dip, you know, you worked on an entire book together. You did 15 covers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we done, yeah I just, you guys are still working together on some new stuff. Yeah. I mean, um, yes. I, I don't know how much I can talk about it right yeah, now. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. I just did some stuff for him. And, yeah. Um, Is this something you have intentions of maybe doing more in the future? For a hundred percent. A hundred percent. When the time is right for me to do something, I would love to, or yeah. at least give my input creative input for him yeah um wherever it needs to be mm. i would love 
absolutely love that. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, man, because you said something not that long ago about when you were working with Rad, that his voice came first. When yeah. it came to the creation of, of these pieces. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can see that because, you know, some of his family members are in the pieces. There's elements of his life in mm -hmm. the pieces. But it wasn't like Rad was telling you, yo, put this in the corner. Like specifically. It's funny. He did do that sometimes. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah, there were specific aspects <laughs> of his some, life that I saw. Yeah, there was, some, sure. there was some symbolism where he was like, I need you to put like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But like, for example, the, the original Save the Youth cover. You know, he didn't. Oh yeah, yeah. He didn't tell you to put, you know, a swastika crossed out in no, the corner. He just so, kind of let me rock with that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah which I appreciate a lot. He yeah. was like, yeah, well, fucking, yeah, why not? Yeah. But that we didn't put that in the final yeah, cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of crazy. course, you know, the label would have been like. Yeah. yeah, that was another moment when I was like, I was like, this is it, fucking, ugh, like, yeah. uh, you know, I just like, <laughs> it's on the table now. Yeah. But I don't need to. And I realized later, I was like, I don't really need to use that type of symbolism. And say fuck that. I don't have to say it yeah. to reject it. Mm, of course. Yeah. It's it's almost already assumed knowing your background, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm Jewish and stuff, so yeah, that would be. I don't look like it. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but I guess the point I'm getting at <laughs> is that al although you work with artists who may direct you a little bit in a sense, mm -hmm. that uh, there's always elements of you that comes through your work. Yeah. And um, I'm just curious, how has it been, you know, how old are you now? You're 24? 23. 23. Yeah. So you're very young I'm in your career. I'm incredibly young. We, we both are. How old are um, you? I'm 26. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I didn't, I never asked you that question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some people either, I don't know, if I have the big beard in the wintertime, I look a couple years older. But, that um, shit's dope as fuck. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll bring it back sometime. Yeah, that was a good, but, a good um, look. For sure. <laughs> thank you, Rad. Yeah. It's, um, you know, when you're at this age, you're still trying to figure out, you know, especially when you're collaborating with others, how much of myself do I put into it? Even mm -hmm. with this podcast right now, I ask myself, how much of my own story do I put in? Yeah. How much do I just dictate the interview and receive information right um what process would you say you're at now with your painting comfort wise with with working with someone like him or yeah someone working else? with someone like him and also in a general sense of knowing you're sharing your pieces online and in your, in your portfolio yeah um it's funny that you compare it to a podcast because a lot of what i do for rad and what i've done for rad and other artists is it's always informed by the conversation I'm always on the phone with them and kind of talking about how their day's going, like how they're feeling in life in general at the time and really kind of breaking down the, the key. Like if I'm working on a, a musical project, I have to break down the key principles of that project. Mm. You know what I mean? I can't just go on a project and be like, oh, hey, it's Gucci Mane. Like, you know what else? <laughs> you know, it's Gucci Mane fucking, uh, you know, ice cream cones on your face. And yeah. Shit. <laughs> um, that wouldn't work for me because I feel like in order to make a, a a cover about something that's intimate as something like nothing changes, nothing changes, I have to break down what the, the key principles of what that sentence means and mm. also the key principles of what the album's talking about. Mm. So for something like nothing changes, nothing changes, that was a, I mean, that was informed by many conversations that went on for hours yeah. pertaining to you know, his family, my family you know, how he grew up, what he values in a, what he values for himself, yes. what he was valuing for himself at that time. Um, it was, a, it, it's really, you know, more than anything, it's informed by the conversation. Yeah. And I kind of draw conclusions from that, literally. Yes. Um, because I, in order for me to make that uh, cover that kind of reaches, um, you know, people outside of the, the culture. Yeah. Um, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, you know, I have to have those conversations first. Of course. It needs yeah. to be real. Absolutely. Not just surface level. Yeah. yeah. I, I can understand completely how all of these conversations were the necessary substrate for you to form context of how to authentically portray yeah. someone's uh, innermost vulnerabilities and truth and family history and um do you have these conversations with yourself when you're working on a piece that is just coming from you do you say 
what's alive within me right now? What's, what am I feeling? Or is it just something that comes out and you have no idea kind of what you're going to do? It's the second one. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like I, it. I always just let it kind of come out and then have the conversation with myself after. Mm. Was this piece for somebody? Yeah, this is for a this is for a show that I did um a bunch of months ago before uh the pan the pandy. Yeah. Um you know. Yeah. Uh for uh this this show that I did um that was showcased at the Hershowing Gallery in uh in in DC. And that was an awesome moment to showcase there. But I kind of did this for myself more than anything. Um the idea was they wanted to do things based on hair. It was based on specifically like uh, black hair and the cultural zeitgeist of that. I told the curators, I was like, hey, you know, um, I'm not black at all. And they were like, no, we just like your work because it, it fits in with what we want to talk about, which I was really, um, uh, I was really honored by that. But I don't think, I mean, I, I, I'm not, you know. And uh, I was worried about making work that would fit their um, their narrative, and they felt like this worked, and I'm very honored for that. But um, I think this was more of a, I think looking back, I think this was more for myself than them. I think this was more about me loving myself, mm. me kind of embracing myself, literally, ha ha ha, ha 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 ha. Um, <laughs> And, uh, it's a beautiful piece, man. And thank you, man. it's, it's, it's all of your pieces are not, um, I know we were speaking about earlier about not being blunt and overt with your symbolism, but at the end of the day, all of your pieces have such a deep sense of, of abstract to them, at least, at thank least you, to someone who, um, may not know you, you know, even someone who does know you, it's never so forthright where you say, oh, I understand this piece completely at least for yeah. me it takes some time I've, I've sat with a lot of your pieces um this is one of my favorites of yours as well especially just because it looks like this person even though they may not be to me it looks like they're almost carrying this image of these people in these her these hearses yeah and um i don't know exactly what it means when I look at it, oh, but man. It, it evokes a, a feeling within me, a strong feeling. It's funny when you say that out loud, cause I never thought of it that way, but that's how I feel a lot of the time. Sometimes mm. I think we all kind of, I mean, you know, we, at least, I don't know how you feel, but I think with, it's funny that, I mean, I did this for the book. I did this for the yeah. nothing changes, nothing's changes book, but rad really gave me a lot of um, awesome creative freedom to make that and to make images for that. And it, I think I already had kind of understood the visual language that we were, that was the, I should answer that. We were building <laughs> a visual language for the album. Mm, and perfect. that was, and understanding that language was pivotal in making the album cover as mm. well as all of the covers for each individual song so that there was continuity, not only in the music, which there was, it was yes. mixed very beautifully. Um, uh, but continuity in the visuals yes. and the music videos. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of part of this. But I feel like this is when you say that it's a little, that's kind of a personal tidbit. I think that, you know, I have a lot of family that, um, close family, grandparents that, um, you know, are, are uh, survivors of, uh, you know, um, you know, the genocide that took place in Europe, the of Holocaust. Course. And I guess sometimes, you know, I think anyone who, I don't think you need to be Jewish to kind of feel that way. If you come, if your family comes to this country and wanting to escape any type of horror, I think their offspring feels that. It's genetic, man. Yeah. The, the trauma is passed down. I mean, that's, that's proven, right? That's proven, man. That's, and that's, I mean, someone could try to debate that, but it's proven in just the stories you hear growing up. If, yeah. if if you're privy to your grandparents' stories about their grandparents, if you're blessed enough to be able to learn from your elders in that way. That's a blessing too. Yeah, it's it's a huge blessing mm. and uh something not to be taken for granted. But no. these um these struggles, this trauma, this pain, it's passed down, man. And yeah. um it's beautiful if you're an artist because you can transmute some of that 
into the release of beautiful pieces like this, you yeah. know. But um, yes, I completely agree. I mean, if you're anyone who has had a uh, genetic history of persecution, which is many of us, it um yeah. shows through our work for it's sure. Insanely common. Yeah. yeah, that brings me into um something else that I've always wanted to discuss with you. What's that? And that is uh, well. Now I'm thinking of like two things, but one, <laughs> I know a lot of people look at your work and think that this guy is like taking psychedelics and doing acid and all this stuff. And yeah. that is, it couldn't be farther from the truth. Yeah, I, it, I don't. That is like not the case because I know you. I love mushrooms, but I'm not. I'm, no, I'm not at all. Yeah. And it, I know people look at this thing and like, oh, he must be blasted. And fuck uh, no. Yeah, no, you're just in your natural state. But second, what I wanted to really ask you was growing up and now. Yeah. On a spiritual level, oh. how does that dictate, you know, just your pieces? Because there's something so animate about your pieces. You know, mm. I don't know if I don't know if you know about the um the idea of animism, but that is that I have no idea about what is that. So animism is like the oldest form basically of not religion, but of a spiritual belief. It's from mm. the basis of where shamanism comes from and where many religious aspects come from and animism is the belief that everything has a spirit that everything has an energy of its own that yeah. rock has a spirit the mountain has a spirit the river has a spirit everything is alive yes and when i look at your your paintings they seem alive to me it's like those damn harry potter paintings that are moving <laughs> <laughs> you know at least at least that's how that's i look at some so of them. awesome <laughs> you know i love that but so um much. that's what, the ultimate compliment mm, no doubt man no, <laughs> it's the most accurate thing i could think of honestly yeah. but spiritually i guess how are you influenced or how, how is your perspective of of life in this reality come through your paintings i know it's a massive question man but um I mean, I learn about it every day. I think I'm always blessed to be around people who have a really in interesting, introspective, and multifaceted grip on their spirituality. Mm. Um, whether it be you or Rad or my mother or my dad or uh, my grandparents. Uh, I think uh, as far as how does my spirituality affect my work? Yes. Is... um. It's it's understanding in the lessons of uh, of of uh, what you take from God, I guess. Mm. I think when I was younger, kind of going to Hebrew school and like learning the Torah somewhat and um, learning about the Holocaust, I learned that God is not always forgiving. Is that God doesn't need to forgive you all the time, because you don't need to forgive anyone all the time. But that mm. doesn't mean that you don't need to forgive yourself. Mm. And I think that that informed my understanding of spirituality and that I think I learned later in life when I got a little older that, um, that loving God is a, uh, is a, is a, is a battle of understanding the information that you need to move forward. Mm -hmm. You don't ask for God for forgiveness, but you ask for God for your, for, uh, for guidance. Mm -hmm. You receive the guidance, yes. however, you're open to receiving it. Mm. And that's kind of what goes into the animism in a way because um, because the guidance comes from everywhere. Yes. You know what I mean? Of course, when you're and aware. When you're aware, sometimes you're, you're not aware and that works to your advantage. Yeah. Sometimes you are aware and that works to your advantage. And I think that's kind of what, what, um, what informs the work because when I see God, I see... Uh, people I love or people that I know or people that I don't really fucking like at all. Yeah. Um, That's all God, man. Yeah. And uh, and people who I will never forgive or maybe I will one day. Maybe mm. I'm just kind of petty. But yeah. um, I think that um all speaks to some of what we were just discussing before we started recording. The, yeah. uh, the idea of we were speaking about failure and what does that really mean? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, mistakes that Sometimes you have to learn things the real tough, hard way in order to move forward. Absolutely. I feel like, um, yes, that is an essence of whatever spiritual force you want to give a name to provides to us as humans and as spiritual beings that um, not every lesson is going to be given in a gentle manner. 
And um, no. Well, sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes. sometimes that's but, pretty cool when it does. Yeah. It's yeah. a blessing. That's what a blessing is. You know, that I mean, is and, that is exactly what a blessing is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's powerful when you can shift your mindset to uh, look at something that is difficult as a blessing as well. Yeah. Because exactly what we're speaking to, um, sometimes it's those tough moments that lead to the biggest revelations and the most beautiful art. And um, I, I mean, look, look at any artist we feel really inspired by. Most of them had a pretty fucked up life. <laughs> Most of them you had know? a pretty fucked up life. But I do have to say, you don't have to have a fucked up life you don't. to have great work, no. too. And I feel like many, um, especially many young people, can be self-destructive because they have this idea that yeah. you have to be depressed and you have to, you have to be, be suicidal and deprived of joy just to create something great, which I think is so important that to know. Couldn't, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Yeah. I, I think that my biggest, I think my biggest... Um, inspirations have come from my hardest moments in my life but i think it's also come from the most loving instances of my life mm, likewise yeah, yeah that stuff has really driven me um to make the work that i make now and that's kind of where you i think i mean it's it's cliche but that's where god lies the most mm. is um in those moments of understanding and understanding what love looks like to from different people mm. sometimes love kind of looks like uh something that maybe a little uh, a little kind of jagged. Yeah. When in reality, it's just they're actually that that individual or that thing or that object is giving you something. Yeah. That you wouldn't really foresee before. Mm, of course, that's just the outer aesthetic. Of yeah. It. It's yeah. it's looking past the aestheticism of what you what you need in life. Yeah. It's kind of counterintuitive because I make aesthetics for a living. But, <laughs> um, yeah, but they're they're more than just aesthetics, and I guess that's what. Uh, that's what we're speaking to here. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. To wrap up, man, I've been yeah. uh, asking all the other guests some of the same questions. And uh, first would be, who are some people right now who are influencing not only your work, but your life? It could be authors, photographers. Yeah, uh, I love... Uh, activists, whoever. I really like my mom a lot. She's great. She does that pretty mm -hmm. heavy. She just kind of reminds me to, keep, to stay focused in my business. Um, and just in, and how to, uh, kind of direct my energies to what I need at the time. She's the, she's the best manager ever. Mm, she's dope. Yeah, she's <laughs> fucking sick as hell. Wow, man. Shout out to all the mothers out there, man. No my, doubt. My mom keeps me on my toes as well. And, and my dad too. Yeah. Him, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> dope, man. No one has shouted out their parents yet. So never, not so far. So I'm, uh. I'm in full agreement with you. Even if they have their own mistakes, I have to give I have to give them props because I wouldn't I wouldn't you know they really they really they didn't have to like that I liked art. Yeah, not at all. You know. Yeah. So they really I think they gave a great investment in me. I have to give give them a, my grandparents too. Mm. I don't really I never really uh, it was never a loving relationship, but it was always an understanding of sacrifice. Mm. Yes. From them. Yeah. Um. As far as artists go, uh, I love. I will always love Ibra Ake's work. It's I B R A. Last name is A K E. It's a great name too. Dope. Um, he's a photographer. I talked about him earlier. Yes. And then, um, Kerry James Marshall is one of my favorite artists of all mm, time. He's, legendary. He's, yeah, he's the best living painter today, mm. in my opinion. Um, if you want to understand where some of my principles lie in terms of painting, you should watch his um. His his lecture at Mocha, Dope. that was cool as fuck. And they did this one in Chicago that was really good too that I liked. Um, cool. I'm gonna put some of these things in the show notes yeah, so that yeah, people yeah. can can check it out. No doubt. I love. I've been getting into this dude. His name. I think his name is Ray Johnson. He's a great um, collage artist that I love. And uh, Aphex Twin. Shout out to that. Shout out to Radimus. Mm, right up. Um, that that's that's. I mean, if you're asking me who's an artist I listen to who inspires me, it's him. Mm. Um, Dope, man. Yeah. Sweet. All of Mogul Club. And yeah. uh, who's a fucking other artist that I like that I've been looking at a lot recently? Man. I really like Faith Ringgold. Mm, I'm not familiar. She's a great painter. Mm. She's the best. Wow, you're putting me on, man. I got a lot of dope she, stuff she's to She's a wonderful, now. wonderful painter. She is a master of symbolism. Mm. She's a master of symbolism wow. in American art. Yeah. She needs to be put on like the highest pedestal of American painters. Mm. 
you nope. know? And I, I love any deep symbolism because uh, symbolism is an uh, ancient language that speaks to us in a very different way than words do. Hell yeah. So um, dope. I'll certainly check that out. Word. Um, what is something that you do every day that you would consider ceremonial? Something that I consider every do every day that I would consider ceremonial is drawing. Mm, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's only right. <laughs> drawing and um, eating good. Mm, no doubt. Did you have for breakfast again? Honey nut cherry. Okay, was, yeah. We were having a good moment about around. that earlier. <laughs> fuck around with the fuck. Around. Yes. <laughs> no doubt. Um, man. Drawing, eating good. Being a man child. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that, man. Yes. And uh, <laughs> especially right now. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, everyone's been inside. And this is the first podcast I'm recording back in this space. Since oh, really? Everything. Yeah. Wow. So it feels good to be. You know, just back in person with historical discussing. Yeah, certainly historical. Man. Mm. Lastly, what is something in your life that you are currently trying to master? Um, discipline, uh, self-discipline and being honest with myself every day mm. about what I want, what I need and what I need to do for myself. Yeah, that's Dope. that's the one. Yeah, me too, man. I think uh, many of us are yeah. on the same journey. It's a boring answer, but it's not at I, all, man. Yeah. It's, it's real and authentic. Yeah. And, uh, thank you, man. It Definitely. is such an honor. And uh, as I said in the beginning, it's so important for me to document artists that I love and I'm interested in. It's like that moment. Uh, I don't know how long ago it was, 40 minutes ago or whatever, when you're like, is this boring? I'm like, who the hell cares, man? I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm interested, man. I yeah, mean, there yeah, could be yeah, zero yeah. viewers on YouTube or Apple or whatever. I right, wouldn't right, care, right. man. You know, this is this is documentation, man. This is history no doubt. for me as well. So I've just never had anyone ask me about my art in the way that you have. Mm, well, it's going to happen more, man, because you're going to continue to create great work. You're young. And uh, thank you, bro. You too. Yeah, man. Thank as you for always. coming on, bro. You're welcome anytime, brother. Definitely. Thank you so no much for having man. me. Of course. Much love, everyone. Peace. Thank you. Bye. Peace, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. If you enjoyed this show and want to learn more about Sam, you can find him on Instagram at Sam underscore Lindenfeld. And you can also check out his online portfolio and website via today's show notes. I really encourage you all to check out his work online. As you can hear and as you can see, he's an artist who puts so much of himself into his art pieces. And I really believe he's someone who is going to continue to grow into such an amazing artist. So I really encourage you to check out his work. And for everybody who has been showing me so much love so far, who has been providing me so much great feedback, comments, likes, sharing of episodes. I just want to thank you all from the depths of my being and encourage others to continue to comment, subscribe, share an episode with a loved one because all these small things really are helping to grow Masters of Ceremony into a beautiful com community-oriented podcast, which is something I find to be so beautiful. So thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Peace.